of Dr. Spiros Artabanis, where she investigated the notch signaling pathway in Drosophila. And uh, she received her PhD in 1997. After that, she moved to UCSF, where she began the work that she'll be telling us about today in the laboratory of Dr. Gail Martin, and where she's been investigating the role of fibroblast growth factory family members in early embryogenesis in the vertebrate, and particularly focusing on limb development. And so today she'll tell us about her work involving FGF4 and FGF8. And the title of her talk is Dissecting the Tissue-Specific Role of FGF During Vertebrate Embryogenesis. <coughs> Thanks, Betsy, um, very much for the introduction and for inviting me. Um, I guess I should put this on. Um, so, um, so I'm interested in uh, how a, uh, a mouse embryo shown here uh, can develop from this very, sim uh, very simple structure into this uh, very different and very complex adult form. And uh, this is interesting because the same developmental programs is, is carried out over and over again, suggesting that there is very tight control on molecular level. And in humans, um, this regulation on molecular level would lead to a uh, birth defect. So it's very important to understand how the molecular programs are regulated. So in order to, uh, if one wants to simplify uh, vertebrate endogenesis, we can uh, um, break it down into hundreds of pattern formation processes in which uh, a simple structure is made more complex. So for example, during gastrulation, uh, this single layer of cell would give rise to three layers of cells. During limb formation, this very simple limb bud is going to give rise to the adult limbs with bones and muscles. Um, during another uh, development, uh, this single <coughs> layer of red cells would give rise to most of our internal organs. So these are the three developmental processes that I'm going to touch upon today. And the key underlying each of those processes is the precise control on cellular level. And what class of molecule that has been repeatedly used to uh, uh, achieve such precise control are uh, secreted family of molecules. And today I'm going to concentrate on one such family, the FGFs. So the uh, vertebrate FGFs is a large family currently uh, cons consisting of 22 members in mouse. Uh, each of the family members would contain uh, a conserved core domain. And downstream of those secreted ligands, they signal through uh, a high affinity receptor tyrosine kinases. And currently in mouse, there are four pollen receptors identified. And downstream of receptors, they signal uh, through uh, the myokinase pathway. So um, in Gail's lab, for the past three and a half years, I've concentrated on two of the family members, FGF4 and FGF8. So why these two out of the 22? Um, we're particularly interested in these two because they're expressed in some of the developmental processes that, are, that we're interested in. That, uh, and I've taken a, a genetic approach uh, to address their function during mouse embryogenesis. So today I'm going to tell you uh, three little stories. First of all, we found that these FGFs function in cell migration during gastrulation. Whereas in limb development, they function more in cell, cell proliferation. Um, and in the last uh, 10 minutes or so, I'm going to give you a little flavor of what I'm interested in doing for the future, which is to use the uh, FGFs as an entry point into understanding the early patterning and differentiation events in endoderm development. So first, let me tell you about gastrulation. So uh, early mouse embryo is also called a gastrula. 
and at uh, embryonic day six or E6 of development, the uh, mouse gastrula is very simple uh, cylinder-like structure separated into the extra embryonic domain and the embryonic domain. So if one dissects the embryonic domain at this stage, you would see two layers of cells. So the outside layer is called the visceral endoderm, which eventually gets displaced from the embryonic domain into the extra embryonic domain. The inside layer uh, is called the epiblast, which is the layer of cells that eventually gives rise to the whole of the mouse embryo. And at this stage, the epiblast is a single layer of epithelial cells, um, which forms a coupled <coughs> structure with a cavity in the middle. And then gastrulation starts. So gastrulation is a process um, in which um, the single uh, layer of cells would give rise to three layers of cells. Um, so I'm going to spend a little bit of time explaining this um, uh, because it's going to help me uh, help you understand our analysis. So um, at the beginning of gastrulation, you would start with uh, this uh, single layer of cells that's, uh, that forms a symmetrical cup-like structure. And half a day later, this uh, symmetry breaks. Uh, first near the rim of the cup, so that the perspective <coughs> posterior side thickens to form a structure called the primitive streak. Now, cells within the primitive streak would lose its uh, epithelial morphology and takes on a mesenchymal morphology. And as more cells proliferate, cells would start to migrate into the primitive streak. And as more and more cells go into the streak, two things would happen. First of all, um, the, the streak region will elongate from the rim of the cup towards the distal tip of the cup. And the sec second thing that happens is that cells within the streak are now starting to migrate out of the streak. And when, when a cell migrates out of the streak, it has two choices of migration path. So if, if it chooses the red path, it will go on the very outside layer and displaces those distal endodermal layer into the extra embryonic region, as I mentioned earlier. So the red cells that are now taking over form the, endoderm, uh, form the endodermal layer. Now if a cell instead chooses the purple path, it would go in between the two existing layers to form the mesodermal wings. Uh, so either a uh, cell chooses the mesodermal fate or the endodermal fate, they would all uh, migrate from the posterior side towards the anterior side. So that at the end of uh, gastrulation, you would have this three-layered structure. Uh, with the internal layer, now called the ectoderm, which will eventually give rise to the skin and the nervous system. Uh, the middle layer, the mesoderm, will give rise to the muscle and bone, uh, heart, etc. And the outside layer, the endoderm, will give rise to most of our respiratory and digestive systems. Um, so shortly uh, after gastrulation in mouse development, uh, uh, embryonic turning event would happen to turn this structure uh, in, outside in before uh, further patterning of all three uh, germ layers. Now I've showed you very briefly that both FGF4 and 8 are expressed in the gastrulating embryo, and in particular FGF8, as shown by this HOMA RNA C2, is expressed in the primitive streak region in the gastrula. So in order to understand its role during um, mouse embryogenesis, we created a null allele of FGF8 and looked at its function during embryogenesis. And we found that homozygotes uh, of this FGF8 null allele die early in embryogenesis with a gastrulation defect. So shown on the left here is a wild type uh, bitter mate. Um, as you can see here, there's a very nice uh, embryonic cup here with a cavity in the middle. Um, on the right is a mutant homozygous embryo, as you can see here already, that it's much thinner than wild type, and it looks as though there are cells filling the middle of the cavity here. Now, to uh, have a closer look at uh, uh, the mutant phenotype, we bisected these embryos in the embryonic portion and look at them more closely uh, using scanning yet. So, again, on the left here is a wild type embryo, as you can see here, is the rim of the cup, and this is the here is the primitive streak region where cells migrate in, change their shape, and migrate out to form the mesodermal and endodermal cells. So in the, um, street, uh, in the in our mutant embryo, we can identify a region where we call the primitive streak in which cells change their shape from epithelial to mesenchymal morphology 
but as uh, soon as cells take on mesenchymal morphology, they're retarded in their migration towards the anterior side. So that if you, uh, say, uh, use the uh, red arrows to mark the leading edges of the mesodermal veins, they um, only go about, go about halfway across to, towards the anterior side, whereas in the um, bar-type mid control, they uh, almost met at the anterior midline. So um, because of the uh, retardation in their ability to migrate out of the street region, these cells actually pile up on the posterior side and eventually pushes into the cavity uh, so that they look like uh, filling the middle of the cavity. So um, studies from Xenopus have shown that uh, FGFs are required for the uh, induction of the mesoderm uh, meso lineage. So we were pretty surprised to see uh, cells with mesenchymal morphology here. So uh, in order to confirm that these are indeed mesodermal cells, we looked at them um, uh, using uh, institutional markers. Uh, so LIN1 is one of the markers that are expressed in the nascent mesodermal wings in the wild-type embryo. And we found that LIN1 is indeed expressed in our mutant embryo, suggesting that these are uh, indeed mesodermal cells. But again, as you can see here, they're defective in their migration uh, away from the primitive street region. So how would uh, molecules uh, such as the FGS as a ligand uh, affecting cell migration. So uh, previous studies, in vitro studies, have shown that FGS um, can uh, regulate adhesion molecules. So we thought that might be a way uh, for them to uh, regulate cell, cell migration. So we looked at uh, a bank of uh, adhesion molecules uh, using um, antibodies uh, in our mutant embryos. So we found that uh, a molecule such as E. coherin, uh, its down regulation is actually delayed in our mutant embryos. So on the left again, here is, is a wild-type embryo. As you can see that uh, E. coherin is expressed in the whole of the ectoderm as well as the primitive street region. But as soon as cells take on mesenchymal morphology and start to migrate away from the primitive street region, they down regulate this very sticky molecule so that they can uh, move around. Whereas in our uh, mutant embryo, here is the streak region, uh, we see a lot more cells in this region that still has uh, E. coherent arm, suggesting that that might be one of the reasons that they're defective in their, migrate, uh, in their ability to migrate away from this region. So uh, there's another uh, interesting twist to the story in that it might not be FGF8 protein per se that is important for migration. And this is because when we looked at uh, the expression of FGF4 uh, using RNA in situ in those in our mutant embryos, we found that FGF4 uh, is not expressed, even though the region in which FGF4 is normally expressed, uh, the primitive street region, is actually present in our mutant embryos. So this suggests to us that, first of all, FGF8 protein perhaps indirectly regulates the expression of FGF4, and, uh, and uh, as well that uh, what we're looking at here in this mutant is actually a, a double loss of function of both FGF4 and FGF8 uh, in the street region. So um, let me just summarize what we learned from our FGF8 null embryos. We found that um, the nascent mesodermal and endodermal cells fail to migrate away from the streak. We found that cation regulation is delayed, and as well that FGF4 is not expressed. So from these observations, we concluded that uh, FGF8 and or FGF4 function um, in the uh, gastrulating embryo is essential for cell migration. And they uh, probably act through some of the downstream adhesion molecules to affect cell migration. So we wanted to use the genetic approach to uh, look at the role of FGFs in other developmental processes. Uh, so one thing that we're really interested in is limb formation. And as I will tell you here, um, we, uh, not only do we find that FGFs are uh, involved in cell proliferation in limb formation, but perhaps more importantly, um, the genetic analysis here allowed us to, uh, uh, to look at limb formation in an alternative view that is different from the currently widely accepted model. So let me first give you a little bit background on limb formation. 
So diagram here is a dot uh, chicken, uh, which is uh, in structure pretty similar to a dot mouselin. Like all 3D structures, it would have three axes. But today I'm going to concentrate your attention on just one axis, the proximal and the distal axis. So along this axis, it has three segments, one, two, and three. And um, in development <coughs> of the limb bud, uh, the uh, three segments are laid down in sequence so that the proximal segment is laid down first and the distal segment is laid down last. So as I've showed you uh, briefly, both FJ4 are, and, and FJ8 are expressed in the developing limb bud and they're expressed in the structure uh, at the tip of the limb bud called the uh, apical epidermal ridge or AER. So AER um, is morphologically different um, from the rest of the epiderm in that it's, it's an epiderm that rims the, the distal tip of the limb bud and it's uh, thickened compared to the rest. And uh, it also has specialized functions. So about uh, 25 years ago now, um, classical chick experiment done by um, Dennis Somerville, uh, John Saunders, and uh, uh, Wolpert and their co-workers uh, showed that uh, the AER is important for the outgrowth. So what they did is remove uh, the AER surgically from develop developing chick limb bud, let the limb bud heal and uh, develop into uh, skeletal structures. They found that AER removal would lead to loss of distal elements. Um, so the key word here is, is um, distal, so they always use distal elements. Um, they also found by removing the AER at different times, for example, if they remove the AER early at stage 21, they would lose extra structures in the AER late, so for example, at stage 27. So from experiments, they were able to plot the stages in which they remove the AER against the end result uh, of the skeletal elements, so that, for example, if they remove the AER at stage 18, they would lose both segments 2 and 3. And I'll come back to this chart at the end of my talk. Um, so about um, 10 years ago now, um, Lee Nicewander in Gale's lab and uh, Dr. Uh, John Paulo's lab and several other groups have shown that uh, if they put, put uh, beads soaked in FGF on those uh, limb bud after AER removal, those FGF beads uh, will rescue the distal element, suggesting that FGF can replace AER in uh, the outgrowth of the limb bud. So from this uh, classical experiment in Czech, uh, a model was put forward to, uh, that, that is uh, widely accepted in the uh, limb film now. Um, so I'll, I'll uh, spend some time explaining this model as, because we're, we're able to uh, do some genetic analysis to test some of the predictions uh, predicted by this model. So this model is uh, called the ProBasal model. So what it says is that there is a region um, in the mesenchyme right underneath the AER called the probasome. And cells within the probasome are undifferentiated, but they're uh, able to respond to differentiation signals. Um, and cells would exit the probasome in sequence to differentiate into uh, limb elements. So this would account to, uh, for the sequential laying down of three segments. So in, in essence, you can sort of view it as a tube of uh, tube waste uh, squeezing out limb elements in sequence. Now, there's also uh, a change of competency for the cells within the probasome, so that the longer the cell stays in the probasome, the more cortisol uh, element it's going to contribute to. The most uh, recent addition to the probasome model is that the signal for such change of competency is the uh, FGS from the AER. Uh, so that if a cell sees the FGF for a longer period of time, it's more likely to contribute to more distal elements. So in other words, uh, FGFs are distalization factors. So what this would predict, uh, that if you uh, reduce uh, or delay the level of FGF from the AER, you would preferentially use distal structures. So we wanted to test that uh, using our genetic approach. So it turns out that uh, FGF4 null, uh, just that uh, FGF8 null that I told you about, uh, would die from initiation of limb formation. So in order to understand their role um, during limb development, we took a conditional, conditional inactivation approach using the Cremox system. 
So um, this is the strategy we use. I'm just going to go through this very quickly as uh, I know now that it's pretty widely used uh, in uh, mass genetics. So uh, here I'm using FGF4 as an example. And in order to inactivate that in the limb, we created two mice. Uh, so in the target mouse, we have inserted two lock sites to flank these essential axons of um, FGF4. So this is called the flux allele of FGF4. In the uh, effector model, we have a clean recombinase expressed under the uh, limb specific promoter. So in the progeny, we have inherited both genotype, um, both um, genetic elements. Um, the uh, flux allele of FGF4 is able to provide uh, wild type uh, FGF4 activity in most tissues, uh, except for the, in the limb where the flux allele is recombined by creating into a non -limb. So in order to carry out the strategy, we first needed to make a, a pre, uh, instance of pre So um, in, order to, uh, in order to do that, we took a piece of the NSX2 promoter that is ADR specific and used it to um, drive pre-expression uh, in transgenic mice. And in order to uh, analyze the uh, activity in those mice, we crossed them to the ZAP reporter mice, which was generously uh, provided to us by Abhinash Naji's group. So what he did in this mice is he has a black Z expressed under a lupus promoter, and its expression is going to prevent the downstream expression of alkaline phosphatase. But lag Z is flanked by lock sites so that after pre-mediated recombination to delete lag Z, uh, that would allow the uh, downstream expression of alkaline phosphatase. So basically, by analyzing alkaline phosphatase activity, you get an idea of what pre has acted. So by uh, crossing the yes, pre mice to the ZAP reporter mice, we were able to see that alkaline phosphatase activity is uh, a kind of concave pattern in the forelimb region and very, very widely expressed. Uh, very widely uh, detected in the uh, <coughs> highland region. And half a day later at 99.5, the uh, alpha activity is widely expressed in the whole of the AR region of uh, and, and again, uh, in the whole of the prospective highland region. So this says to us that this FSX decree is active in the entire uh, prospective uh, forelimb uh, AER starting at uh, 0.5 and in the prospective highland but uh, even earlier at B, uh, B9. So the timing of F, uh, the Cree activity is important for our analysis, and I'll come back to that later. So using this MSX decree, we were able to completely inactivate FGF4 in the limb region, and to us, um, we found no phenotype. So um, as shown here by those mutant uh, schedule perhaps uh, as compared to the wild type. A similar result was also achieved by Dr. Mario Kopecki's uh, lab, and our results here suggest that FGF4 is not essential for the development. So unlike FGF4, when we use the same MSX2 cream mice to inactivate uh, FGF8 in the limb, we did see a phenotype, uh, which is generally a reduction of organ uh, elements. Uh, but uh, more, uh, most dramatically, we found that in the high limb, the most proximal element, uh, segment, segment one, is very dramatically reduced as compared to the wild type. And such a uh, dramatic extent of reduction is only uh, observed in the high limb, not in the forelimb region, suggesting that forelimbs and high limbs are differentially affected. So in, the, uh, in order to understand why that is, we um, looked at the timing of pre-function uh, in relationship to uh, uh, trans uh, FGF transcription and, the, uh, and uh, FGF activity. So first of all, I want to uh, concentrate attention here just on those green bars here, which is pre-function. So as I've mentioned, in the forelimb region, pre-activity is complete in the uh, uh, starting at uh, 9.5, which is earlier than uh, initiation of FGF4 transcription, but it's later than FGF8 transcription. So this would lead to the early um, window of FGF. H activity, which is followed by a pretty normal FGF4 activity later on. And some of you might have noticed here already that even though that FGF8 is inactivated from the 9.5 onwards, FGF4 is still transcribed here. So suggesting that uh, the FGF8 ability in regulating FGF4 transcription is very tissue specific. 
So in our high limb here, as I mentioned, that pre is active from E9 onwards, which is earlier than the <coughs> action of FGF8. So you completely inactivate FGF8, but and then again FGF4 comes on later, uh, which would leave this early window of no FGFs uh, supplied from the AER. So this early window is the difference basically between up, uh, high and low limb. Now, uh, I mentioned that the uh, ProVessel model would uh, suggest that if AER GF such as factors. factors. Then uh, if you use that um, to apply to our uh, Heinemann, um, we would predict with the delayed and reduced FGF levels, our Heinemann should have a delayed formation of all limb elements as well as the preferential deletion of the distal element. Now this is different from what we see, which, uh, which is almost the opposite, which we see preferential reduction of the pro pro proximal element. So this suggests to us that at least FGF8 is not a distalization factor. So just to summarize what we learned from our uh, limb uh, specific FGF8 knockout, we found that FGF8 is uh, essential for normal limb formation. And the limb phenotype, uh, especially the high limb phenotype in those meters, suggests to us that FGF8 is not a distalization factor. Okay, so um, the fact that FGF4 is uh, expressed in our FGF8 mutant uh, suggests to us that there might be some uh, redundancy between FGF4 and H in the lens. So in order to get at that, I uh, created a uh, double um, conditional knockouts on 4 and 8 in the lens. And that gave us really dramatic phenotypes. So, um, so these mice have almost, uh, it's almost missing the whole of this, uh, uh, the high limb uh, elements and its four limbs is very uh, short. So from the high limb elements, we wanted to conclude that the combination of FGF4 and activity is required for the formation of all limb elements. Now some of you might say here that um, Wait a minute, how do you know that you're not creating some sort of chromosome uh, ana anomaly here that basically just kill the AER cells? In other words, how do you know that this high limb phenotype is not due to an early uh, AER removal? So in order to control for that, we looked at uh, the de developing limb by all those animals using uh, a full length um, FGF8 probe that is able to recognize the part of FGF8 that is not deleted by the combination. So using this probe, we found that in the high limb, especially that uh, the FGF8 expressing AER cells remain intact. So this suggests to us that uh, the high limb phenotype is not due to a early AER removal. Uh, what you can see also here is that both um, the full limb and high limb uh, buds are smaller compared to the wild type, and high limb is more severely affected than full limb. Now again, to understand why four limbs and hind limbs are differentially affected, we uh, look at the timing of pre activation. So as I mentioned in the single knockout, in the four limb, pre uh, acts early enough to inactivate FGF4 completely, but leaves this early window of FGF8 activity. Whereas in the hind limb, uh, pre is able to inactivate both completely. So given that the um, uh, the AER remain intact in our highland bud. Uh, we uh, now conclude that FGF4 and 8 activity can account for AER activity in the entire proximal distal axis. Now, if you apply this conclusion to the forelimb, you, in which there is an early window of FGF8 uh, that is inactivated uh, by E9.5, you will predict that the forelimb phenotype should be similar to a chick AER removal phenotype at an equivalent stage of, uh, to E9.5, which in check is uh, about stage 18. So what happens uh, if you remove the AR at stage 18? Let me just remind you that you would lose both segments in two and three. Now, is this what we see in the um, in our mutant forms? Uh, this is different from what we see here, uh, as shown by these two examples here. Um, in our forms, uh, mutant forms, we always see both segments two and three. Uh, but they are uh, much uh, more reduced in size when compared to the wild type. So this suggests to us that inactivation of FGF4 and H is not equal to the AER removal. And why is that? 
Now, um, studies uh, done by John Paul, uh, Dr. John Fowler's group have shown that if you remove the AER, it would uh, result in a, a big uh, cell death domain in the underlying reason kind. So we thought it's possible that the precursors actually for the uh, segments, the, the second and third segments are actually present in the underlying mesenchyme at the time of the AER removal, but they're killed because of the cell death, so they're not manifested into the uh, resulting uh, uh, skeletal elements that were scored. So in other words, the limb element precursors will be present in the lymph blood much earlier than predicted by the AER removal and as well as the pro-vessel model. So uh, when we have the res got the result, we uh, communicated with uh, with several other people in the limb field, and we were happy to find that there are data from Clayton's lab uh, that pointed to the same uh, conclusion, perhaps more directly, they were doing some uh, lineage analysis data that uh, resulted in the same uh, conclusion. So uh, given the uh, inconsistencies we found uh, from our data and uh, the existing ProVessel model, we thought perhaps it's time to come up with uh, alternative model um, to uh, better uh, uh, explain our, our um, data. Um, so I will tell you the, about the model we came up first, and then I'll, I'll tell you how we uh, can be used to explain our model, uh, our results. So the model we came up is called the allocation and expansion model. So what it says uh, is that the uh, progenitors for all three segments of the limb is actually uh, laid down very early in limb development to be separate from each other. So they're not necessarily committed, but they're uh, allocated uh, to be separate from each other. And so what, what they need to do um, in, during the most of the limb development is just to expand. Um, and they, they start expansion at, uh, at the same time, and each progenitor population would need to expand to minimum size to form an element. And as well, even though that they start expansion at the same time, the, uh, they stop expansion at different times so that the pro proximal population complete its expansion before the distal population. So this would account to the sequential laying down of the three segments. And lastly, the uh, expansion is dependent on FGS provided from the ER. So how does this model um, fit with our data? <coughs> so in our single uh, knockout pollen, you would have this early window of FGF8, which is followed by FGF4. Um, so you would always have some FGS around, although at reduced levels. So that all three segments are reduced somewhat, but they're affected um, in, in, in a similar way. Uh, whereas in the highland, um, we have this uh, lack of FGF signal from the AER early on, which would slow down the expansion of all three segments. <coughs> By the time FGF4 kicks in, it's too late for the expansion of the proximal segment because it's done its expansion already, but it's able to uh, expand the two distal segments uh, so that they're uh, rescued a little bit in compared to the proximal. In our double knockout fallen, we would have this early window of FGF8, um, which allowed the expansion of all three populations somewhat. And FGF8 is uh, inactivated by 9.5, and the protein might hang around a little bit, but not for very long. Um, and this inactivation is not going to affect the expansion of the proximal population because it's done its expansion already, but the two distal segments don't get the extra expansion they need, so it remain a uh, lot smaller in the mouth type. Where, uh, you know, uh, double knockout highland, no FG4 or actually from the AER, so none of the three populations gets big enough to manifest into uh, segments. So uh, this model can um, actually explain on the uh, data pretty well. And uh, as well, from that, um, temporal control of uh, FJ4 and the activity is important for the mouth rules. Now again, how would a uh, signaling molecule like FGF affect uh, the mouth rules? We think it's uh, one of the reasons it will affect the mouth rules is perhaps through uh, cell proliferation. And here, uh, I'm using a uh, antiphosphorylated histone antibody to label a cells in mitosis. And as you can see here, in mutant limb blood, there are cells in mitosis when compared to wild type. So how would uh, FGS from the AER affect cell uh, proliferation in the underlying mesenchyme? 
So we think it's probably acting through mesenchymal uh, factors that uh, have been shown to be involved in uh, cell proliferation. So for example, FGF10 is expressed in the underlying mesenchyme in the wild type, the bud, and FGF10 is reduced in the uh, double mutant forelimb and its absence in the uh, double mutant hindlimb. So just to summarize, um, what we learned from the double uh, knockout in the limb, we found that the combined FGF4 and 8 activity, even though it's not required for integrity of ER, it's required for the formation of all limb elements. And um, limb element precursors uh, are, are probably specified earlier than predicted by the AER removal experiments. Um, and lastly, the FGF4 and 8 activity is required for some proliferation during the development. And uh, as you can recall, it's a different function from their role in some uh, uh, during gastrulation, suggesting that uh, it's important uh, in what those signaling molecules, um, in what kind of downstream uh, pathways those signaling molecules are actually feeding through. So um, for the last um, five to 10 minutes or so, um, I'd like to give you a little uh, introduction of what I'm interested in doing for the future, which is using FGFs as an entry point into understanding uh, endoderm development. Um, so uh, why endoderm? So I got interested in endoderm uh, because it's sort of one of the areas of de developmental biology that is um, just beginning to be explored. So there are a lot of really interesting questions in this area of research. And as well, uh, a lot of defects uh, in human, uh, human birth defects are involved in uh, visceral endoderm, or visceral tissues are, are endoderm derived. So, um, just a little bit more background now. I mentioned earlier that endoderm starts off as a single layer of cells in the outside of the gastro, and uh, after that, the turn turning comes, uh, takes place. This uh, outside layer is get, uh, gets turned into the inside layer and gets rolled into a very simple endodermal tube. And from this tube, different buds for different organs will come out. And then cell differentiation with um, cell different uh, cells with, uh, with different uh, 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 functions to form. So I'm particularly interested in uh, how uh, the access of this uh, early primitive endodermal tube is determined so that different buds would come out with different uh, identity from this very simple tube. <coughs> now, our understanding in the endoderm um, lags behind our, our understanding of uh, in the uh, two other, uh, in the, in the, two, in the um, mesodermal and ectodermal layer, uh, mostly because it's, this layer is internal, so it's hard for embryological manipulations. Now, with the advancement of uh, uh, mouse genetic technologies, we can now target uh, specific tissues such as um, So I think that approach now uh, on a, a lot of new areas of questions that could be addressed. So for example, two will be used. So HNF3 alpha uh, is a gene that is expressed in the entire endodermal lineage from very, on, very early on in endogenesis. Now, Klaus Kaysner at the University of Pennsylvania not in Cree under the transcription control of Fox A1. And he uh, generously uh, changed mice with us. And when we analyzed the Cree activity in such a mouse, um, you can see here Cree's activity in, in the entire um, endoderm lineage, including, for example, here the thymus primordial and the liver and the region. So using a tool like this, you can, uh, first of all, do lineage analysis and following whether endoderm cells uh, end up in what kind of cell types they become. And as well as you can uh, now um, do uh, targeted gene manipulation specifically in this lineage. Now another reason that I got interested in endoderm is that uh, a lot of the uh, endoderm derived organs contain stem cells. For example, liver and intestine uh, contain stem cells, which are important uh, in regeneration events in the adult. So the, uh, the uh, obvious questions here is that how are they maintained and how are they activated? And uh, misregulation of these events would lead to uh, cancer. Um, on, at least on the cellular level, there's a lot of similarities between uh, organogenesis and regeneration. Organogenesis in the embryo and regeneration in the adult. So I'll, I'll be interested in looking at whether some of the molecules I found uh, in organogenesis will also have a role in regeneration events. 
So as I mentioned, I'm interested in using FGFs as an entry point because that, uh, from in vitro studies as well as expression studies, uh, FGFs have been, been uh, implicated uh, in, for example, anterior posterior patterning, liver induction outgrowth, and thymus outgrowth during animal development. So I'm interested in using a genetic approach to uh, test the relevant in these processes. So for example, um, during um, uh, thymus formation, so thymus forms from uh, the uh, pharyngeal endodermal region in which uh, both FG4 and FG8 are expressed. Now, um, in, in our lab, we have a partial or functional FG8 mutant. Uh, and when I took out the thymus, as you can see here, they're consistently smaller than wild type. And in human, uh, birth defects such as DeGeorge syndrome uh, has uh, hypoplastic thymus. So it will be interesting to see if these mice are actually similar to those uh, syndromes. And uh, here I'm interested in using the genetic, genetic approach uh, to now tissue specifically uh, inactivate FGF8 or FGF4 completely in thymus and see if they're indeed uh, involved in uh, thymus formation. Now for the long term, I'm also interested in looking at other molecules that might be involved. And for that, as I mentioned, I'm interested in how different organs but uh, buzz out of the very simple endodermal tube. And I'm interested in uh, concentrating the liver pancreas region uh, because the major pancreas bud uh, comes out from the dorsal side, whereas the liver bud comes out from the equivalent region on the ventral side. So by uh, identifying genes differentially expressed in both and uh, the pancreas, uh, I hope to get at mechanisms that's involved in the uh, early dorsal natural patterning of the endodermal tube, as well as uh, molecules that are important for the early differentiation of these two organs. So uh, just to summarize what I'm interested in doing for the future, I'm interested in using FGFs as the entry point into understanding endodermal development and uh, in terms of other molecules might be involved, I've already uh, started a subtractive screen uh, in trying to identify genes differentially uh, expressed in the liver versus pancreas buds. And in the future, I'm uh, interested in um, extending that into using microarray analysis as well as candidate gene approaches into identifying differentially expressed genes. And once the candidate gene is, uh, is uh, identified, I'm interested in using the genetic approaches I've uh, used for my uh, other analysis that I mentioned to look at their role during um, anecdotal development. So, um, finally, I'd like to thank a few people. Um, at UCSF, I would like to thank uh, Eric Myers and Mark Lewandowski for um, generating some of the object A the Leo used in my analysis. And Mark uh, collaborated with Yixin Liu and Rob Maxson at USC to generate the SX2 cream mice. And finally, I'd like to thank Gail for her generous support and advice for the last three times. Thanks. Questions? So, in respect to limb development, where you talked about FGF or F8, having some dosage-sensitive um, additive properties. Can you analyze whether they have any differential, qualitatively different properties by making a substitution of the yeah. sequence into the four locus? Right, right. Yeah, so that's a very good question. And in fact, that experiment has been done in Gale's lab. So there's, um, we're, uh, we're knocking in FGF, uh, we're knocking FGF8 into the FGF4 locus to try to get questions like that. In terms of what I've seen, um, in, in limb outgrowth process, it doesn't seem to be a very different, qualitative different, difference in between these two genes. But in other systems, like in, um, in uh, somite formation, um, there's some data from Olivia Poquet's group that suggests that FGF8 has a different, different role as FGF4 process. Is that based on gene substitution? No, that's more from um, uh, implanting um, beads, so obtaining different proteins. So I think they, they put FGF8 beads was able to do something, whereas FGF4 beads didn't do. So, John? I think with regard to Bill's question, the FGFs are strictly permissive in the development. So mm -hmm. their presence permits uh, whatever happens to happen. And whether a balance is required, 
is open to question because you can substitute any one of them and get the whole thing to occur. In culture? Uh, in, in vivo, in a chicken. Take off the apical rate and put in a bead with FGF, and one of them will do the whole job. Uh, so uh, I, we come at uh, this idea of early specification from a different direction and kind of the same conclusion. Oh, As you have, but there are all kinds of difficulties. Yeah. Uh, for, uh, so have you thought about the experiment where you graph proximal cells from segment one mm -hmm. uh, into the distal? And yeah. they will differentiate now as distal. Or you could do the reverse, yeah. the distal cells proximal, now they'll differentiate uh -huh. as proximal. So. Right, right. So why, why is that? How do I explain that? Is that, is that your question? Yeah, so, so the, I mean, I should say that this model is, is still fairly new. Miguel and I, so, and together with Cliff's lab, we sort of came up with this model and we, we're still in the process of debating back and forth with how it fits with the existing data. But in terms of that specific question, um, we think that, we, we say that the three populations are allocated early, but they're not determined, they're not committed. So that if you put them separately into a new environment, they would respond to the new environmental cues. So in that sense, it's similar to gastrulation, where uh, cells coming out of the different parts of the street would have different fate. But as um, uh, Patrick Hamm has shown, if you've taken the cell that come out of the heart-forming region and put it back into the epiblast for them to go through the street again, they would re-specify to a, a, a different fate if you put them into a different region. But I don't understand then why in the FGF um, uh, force is it knockout? No, FGF is knockout. Yeah, yeah. You end up with proximal deletions and the distal parts are okay yeah. Yeah. because it's that uh, genetic experiment is the same as moving uh, the tissue from proximal to distal proximal. I mean, those cells are regulating, and why can't in the knockout the cells regulate yeah. and give you yeah. the entire yeah. element? But, but in that sense, you're not shifting individual cells, you're shifting the whole segments, right? So it's a piece, a, just a little tiny piece. Sure, sure, but it's a group of cells. Yeah. So, my way, I mean, the, the, the way how I picture it might not be the correct way, is that if the cell stays in the group, they're, they're still soaking in, the, in their own environment, whereas if you put them you know, into a, a totally environment, now they're probably able to get, the, say, the distal cell um, signals for them to change their fate. I just want to hear about your thinking about it because I'm having trouble. Right. Well, we're having trouble with it, yeah. thinking about it. Yeah. But the cells seem to be uh, keeping track of something there. Yeah. And uh -huh. uh, that is an explain. Right. I mean, one experiment that um, we've been, we've been uh, discussing with Cliff's lab that he's interested in doing is, is that cell mixing experiment by taking a new time out and just totally trypsinize them, mix them, and then re-aggregate them and put them under an uh, ectodermal jacket again. Yes. Um, so that experiment was done um, many years ago now. But he was interested in now labeling each cell populations and uh, and then mix mix them together and see if there's actually cell sorting that goes on before the pulp grows on the lip. So I already know the answer. There isn't cell sorting. There is. No. Oh, okay. Well, there we go then. <laughs> if you mix it up, check. Oh, okay. okay. It's the regionalization. You were suggesting that the regionality was contained in the reason kind of. Yeah. Well, hasn't these, when you label single, single platform fairly, do they contribute to all segments? Or yeah, so that's, that's the example that Cliff did. Um, he used the um, uh, uh, replicate competent um, virus to label single cells in the very early limits. Um, they only contribute to one single cell. Do you see any difference in terms of the gastrulation defects between FGF4, 8, and yeah, so, um, so FGF4, uh, no, and real died before gastrulation. So one of the experiments we're interested in doing is to match a street specific not column of FGF4. Um, and in order to get that question of is FGF4 required for migration or is FGF8 for migration? Um, in terms of receptor, receptor 1 knockout has a similar gastrulation, but it's slightly milder than FGF8 now, suggesting that there might be some common 
sensation most likely from the receptor too. When the endoderm folds in, is that to the extent of uh, the mouth to anus, or does it uh, grow in a mouth to anus direction? Is there a directionality? I'm, I'm um, so when it folds in, I mean, how does it? So it actually starts folding from both ends, yeah. right? Yeah. So what's so? Uh, it, it, does that represent the mouth to anus axis, uh -huh. the entire axis, or is there a proliferation uh, uh, in the mouth to anus? I axis? see. I see. I think it uh, probably um, represents the entire axis. There is proliferation, but it's proliferation within the axis, so it's really produced new. That, that's yeah, that's it. exactly. Right. Yeah. Um, I'm wondering what kind of markers you look really early on to pull out the what your CSS is the very much better for the I see. Right. So um, we've looked at um, a whole lot of differentiation markers for say for example the isodermal markers, the uh, plain isodermal markers. And all those markers are expressed in very small populations of cells, so um, so that basically FGS does not require a fake decision in the early stages. Uh, where, where it's, it's involved in migration, but the few cells that can make it out of the street region um, to get the uh, specification signals, they can actually make the cell types that they, they become. <coughs> have you given any thought to how we just help? What are the cells <coughs> experiencing the base? Yeah, yeah. So we think the Japanese street is a uh, more permissive signal. Um, to for migration, um, so I talked to Patrick Tam about you know how cells move in and out. So he thinks that uh, how cells move into the streak is more uh, a, a sort of a non-active um, process, in that they're just pushed into the streak because proliferation that goes on, uh, they're pushed in. In terms of them coming out, um, there might be some active uh, migration going on. If you look at those cells that don't migrate, now into embryos, they actually have this really flattened out shape as if they're stressed out and trying to find the substrate or find you know, the correct thing to migrate out, but they're not they're slipping somehow. So, um, so there might be some sort of active uh, migration going on in cells coming out. So there are some people who believe that the Ibigo Ridge is a chemo track and, and what you're feeling about that. Right, um, mostly for um, muscle cell migration, right. Um, so we've looked at that um, a little bit in our um, uh, to look at whether the muscle cells are migrating. We still do get some muscle cells that are migrating, but whether that's because there are other FGFs and they're still present or, or um, Yeah, my husband used to be the same. 
Yeah. Really? Yeah, yeah. her husband was supposed to as well. Oh, very nice. That's, yeah. That's the... <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So is Shree also here? Yeah. Okay. Okay, terrific. I love it. Terrific. There's a little time. Oh, 